Hello. As you can see, uh, I'm not in the church, and if you've been following my day by day series, I am not in my usual place either. This is for Sunday, the 21st of June 2020, and it's a kind of first run through for me. What I've discovered is that as I do this, uh, I'm doing this is on the Saturday, and by the time whatever it is is offered on Sunday morning, there's been a bit more development. So <clears throat> what you're getting is the uh, the first attempt, the first uh, the first try at uh, what hopefully will be a fuller uh, exposition when it comes to delivery on the Sunday morning. This morning I was, uh, for this morning, I was going to be looking at uh, Genesis chapter 21. It was the, the lectionary reading, or the Old Testament lectionary reading for the day. And there were some things about that, and I'll probably pick them up as part of this, uh, this message today. Um, but then I came across something else just a couple of days ago. So what I'm looking at is John chapter 16 verses 12 to 15 and it's really got me thinking it's taking me further than uh, down a certain line which we will talk about in a minute where I have been before so John chapter 16 verse 12 I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now when the Spirit of Truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own, but He will speak whatever He hears. And He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, because He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is Mine. For this reason I said that He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your words as you offered them to your disciples. And we pray that as we reflect upon them this day, that they will indeed be your word to us. And uh, we give this time that we've been sharing together into your care. I pray for grace as I share what's on my heart and open this within us to hear what it is that you might be inviting each of us into. In Jesus' name. Amen. My brother gets me to speak at uh, his church once, usually once a year or so. And um, we had a conversation a couple of days ago and he's given me a text and a topic that he wants me to talk about. Now, I find that really quite difficult, as I explained to him. There's a sense for me that what I'm looking at has to be lively. It has to have life for me. Otherwise, it becomes a dry exercise. Not quite academic, but I'm never sure whether this is something the Lord is doing or whether it's something that I just have to go through the process of doing. And I mean there are times clearly for Sunday mornings where I feel that way anyway. After all I have to front up with something don't I? So it actually has a bearing on what we're going to be talking about today. And one of the things that I've been musing about over the last couple of years is the question did God stop speaking with the completion of the New Testament? Now some of you will have heard me talk about this before. Did God finish speaking 2,000 years ago? And I know that there are many that would answer affirmatively yes and they would quote things like uh, Jude 1 verse 3 where we're encouraged to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints it's complete it's a done deal it's settled 
That's all we need. Hmm. Okay. That may be the case. I used to think that. I used to be sure that that was the case, that in fact everything that we need is actually within the confines of the 66 books of the Old and New Testament of the Bible. And it probably is, and in many ways it <clears throat> is as I use this that the Holy Spirit enlivens things to me 2,000 years later. But the thing that I was brought to the other day was the passage which we have just read. And it starts with these words. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. That word forbear has a sense of to carry, to, to tolerate, a sense of if I said too more, if I said more, it would just be too hard. You wouldn't be able to handle it. And what this is suggesting to me is that what I have now long believed that there is a kind of progressive nature to the to revelation that God takes us on a journey, and we see that. Um, I think most explicitly stated in Galatians. I think it's Galatians three where Paul says that the law that stayed there was a schoolmaster designed to lead us to Christ. There's this unfolding process where God is at work initially in a primitive people in barbaric times as God reveals God's self to them and they progressively become opened to the grace, the goodness, the generosity the love of God as, as, as time unfolds and their understanding of God grows and something deep happens on the inside and as a result of that when they're introduced to Christ and they move into a new way of engaging with God where as E. Stanley Jones would say they are now in Christ by surrender they experience God in a richer and a fuller way. And their lives take on a richness. They become more expansive, more generous, more open, more full and whole human beings. That's hopefully us. And so we would expect to see change. And so the question then becomes for me, um, is the Bible, is it a guidebook or is it a, is it a signpost? And the answer to that question is yes. Yes, it is. It is a guidebook and it is a signpost. It's a guidebook in terms of offering some profound principles. It's a place that we can go back to again and again and again and never exhaust because the Lord by His Holy Spirit is always revealing new stuff. But it's also a signpost pointing us forward, pointing us ahead, pointing us in a direction which in a sense goes beyond itself. And a lot has changed in the last 2000 years. A lot has changed in the last 150 years. A lot has changed in the last 10 years, and even more has changed in the last two years. And so we are faced with continuing to encounter this God of this book, which is 2,000 plus years old, in our day and our age, and to recognize that it offers guidance and it also points us forward. When the Spirit of Truth comes, this is verse 13, He will guide you into all truth. This is a promise. For He will not speak on His own. He will speak whatever He hears. Now this, the word that is used there for speak, 
has exactly that. It's a talking. It's a, it's, it's relating to heard speech. And he will declare to you the things that have come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it. He will announce it to you. And it seems to me that there is a sense that we should expect to hear the voice of God. Now we have to be really careful about that because we need to discern. One of the guidelines he gives it here is that he will glorify me. That the voice of God will never diminish Jesus. Will never diminish the role, the person, the place, the worship of Jesus. Always invites us to an awareness of the love and the grace that Jesus has shown and has demonstrated towards us. That he alone is worthy of worship. So that's one of the things. And I've become aware, as those of you who have listened to me over the last 25 years will know, that God has spoken in ways that I never recognized at the time. I can sort of chart significant moments in my life. Uh, when I've been under the pump, under the hammer, when I've been in a tight space. And the voice of God has spoken clearly into my life. Now, I didn't recognize it as that as the time. It sounded like me talking to myself. Yet, as I look back, I recognize now that this was the guiding hand, the word of grace that came to me. And one of the things that I observe is that the voice of God is always much smarter than I am. <laughs> much smarter, much wiser, much more generous, much more loving, and sometimes firmer. I can remember one particular incident where there was things that I didn't want to hear, but I needed to hear. And it was lovingly and graciously and wisely offered came to me. Actually I happened to be in the shower at the time and I was almost in tears because I was just so bereft and beside myself and it was just this quiet sense of clarity, this quiet sense of insight, these words that came and I was able to move forward. It wasn't easy but I knew it was right. I knew it was right and it was life-giving. What I also observe is that the Holy Spirit draws to my attention things that I wouldn't have noticed before. Things that I'm now ready to see, that I wasn't ready to see. And that as I see them, I notice that they have been there all the time. I just didn't notice. And one of the things in relation to that is what happens in Genesis chapter 21. Because we see in Genesis 21 the promise of Isaac. But also the blessing of Ishmael. Now, we see the covenant of God made with Isaac. The promise of the covenant being made with Isaac. And for the Jewish people, that's the thing that matters. And this book, the Bible, the book of Genesis, here is transmitted through the Jewish people. But I wonder, for the descendants of Ishmael, what they would have seen, and what they would see, and what they do see when they read it. Because for us who stand in the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's easy to dis dismiss 
Ishmael as being of little relevance. And yet when you track through in Genesis chapter 17, where the story of Ishmael starts, and read carefully and look for how the Lord deals with Ishmael, and then track into chapter 21, we see these rich promises of blessing made to Ishmael. It's easy to not notice. Because we're so hooked up on the other story. And yet we see that God has a subtext. God has another story that's running alongside the one that we're always drawn to. And it's a story of blessing. It's a story of grace. It's a story of honoring and liberation. Even for the one who is despised. Even for the one who is regarded as the lesser. Yet it is a story of the love and the grace of God. I'm really grateful to the Holy Spirit. I'm really grateful that the Lord has me on a journey of discovery. And I have not and do not believe I ever will reach a point where I think I have it all. It also encourages me to be patient. To be patient with those who are not where I am. Patient with those who are still, I think, to discover a freedom that could be theirs. They may look at me and think that I need to be free in other ways, and they may be perfectly right. There are things that for them are simple and straightforward and they're able to freely move in that have not been graced to me, yet may one day, one day. And so it's about actually honouring others where they are on the journey and being able to walk with one another with a measure of dignity, with a measure of recognising that the Lord is at work by His Spirit in each one of us. And no two of us are, working, are walking exactly the same journey. And it's okay. It's okay. I don't have to convince anybody that I'm right and they need to get with the program. And I don't have to be convinced by others that I'm wrong and need to get with the program. The Lord is quite capable of dealing with me where I am in his own way, in his own time. He may say directly to me, Andrew, I still have many things to say to you, but you, can, you cannot bear them now. But there will come a time when you will. There will come a time when you're ready. There will come a time when I'm able to show you more fully the sense of who I am and more of the richness that I have for you. May that be the case. May that be the case for me and for you. God bless you.